In this course, we will be using .NET 8. Right now, .NET 8 is in preview. So if you download .NET 8, currently Preview 2 has been released. First, you have to download the version based on your system. I have downloaded Windows X64. And once you download .NET 8, then you have to download Visual Studio 2022 Preview. You need the preview version if you want to work with .NET 8 because it has not been released yet. Preview version can be downloaded for free. Just go to visualstudio.microsoft.com forward slash vs forward slash preview. Make sure to install .NET 8 and Visual Studio Preview before you proceed with the course. Now if you want to follow along with .NET 7, you can obviously do that and everything will work other than one change that has been introduced in .NET 8 where they have new type for date only and time only. But other than that, everything will work perfectly fine with .NET 7 as well. Let me give you a brief overview of what we will cover in this course. Now as we know, we are building a real world application, so our final project will have an entire architecture. When we work with entity framework for database, we will be using repository pattern and unit of work. Then we will see temp data, view back, view data in .NET Core, what are the differences between them and ideally when you should use each one of them. We will also see API controllers along with razor pages. Then we will integrate many advanced features like suite alerts, rich text editor, data tables with .NET Core, so basically many JavaScript packages. After that we will integrate security in our application. For that we will use the .NET identity and we will implement roles and authorization in our application. In order to capture payments we will be using Stripe payment and we will also see how to process refund using Stripe. Then we will see sessions in .NET Core and how to send emails using SendGrid. We will also build a user management in our website where basically we will manage all the users. We can toggle their roles dynamically. On top of that, we will implement social login using Facebook. That way they do not have to enter all the details when they sign up. We will also look at some advanced concepts like view components in .NET Core and how to see database using DB Initializer. Once the application is complete, we will deploy the complete application to Azure and that way you will gain experience on how to deploy your application. Now what I have covered right now is a 10,000 feet overview. So let me continue with our journey from the next video. What we have to do is create a project using Visual Studio 2022. I have opened Visual Studio 2022 here and I will select create a new project. On the left hand side here, I will have recent project templates. But what we want to do here is search for MVC. And with that, we should get ASP.NET Core web app. Now the project we want to work on is MVC application. So make sure to select the one with model, view and controller. There is also a web app without MVC that uses Razor Pages. We do not want that. We will give our project a name of bulky web, location, wherever you want to save it. And then we need a solution name. Now solution name, I will keep that as bulky because in there we will have multiple project. With that configured, let me hit the next button. The framework that we want to use is .NET 8. We will select that. Authentication type, we will be adding authentication later on. But right now we want to keep things super simple and then we will add on to our project. So right now we will keep that as none. Configure for HTTPS, that looks good. And we will not check the do not use top level statements. It is just adding the using statements at the top and it is not that important. 
That is why we can just ignore that and hit the create button. With the click of that button, the magic happens and your project is created. I will explore all the files and folder that are being created by default. But before that, let me add this to source control. I have already signed into my git repo. So that is coming along. Repository name, let me call that bulky underscore MVC. I will make that a private repository for now. But once the course is launched, I will convert that to be a public repository. With that configured, let me hit create and push button. And perfect, we have two outgoing changes. Let me push them. Perfect, so we have created our project and we have committed our code to the Git repo. Our project is created here. Let me walk you through all the files that we see right here one by one. But before I even do anything with that, let me run the application by clicking the HTTPS here and that will build the project and open that in the browser. Perfect. By default, we have a simple application. Let me zoom in here. And we have two things in the header here. Home page where we see welcome here. And we have a privacy page where it displays a different page. So one thing you can see right out of the box, we have a header here, we have a footer, we have a body here, and we have navigation that is already configured by the default .NET project. That is great news. But before we take a look at any other files, the main file that I want to show you is the project file itself. To examine the project file, you have to right click on the project. Now here there are two things. One is a project which is bulky web and then one is a solution which is bulky. A solution can have multiple project in .NET. Right now we only have one project which is bulky web. When we examine the project file, it belongs to a project. So we will right click on bulky web which is our project and there we have something called as edit project file. Perfect. When I open that, you can see it is pretty simple right now. In the older versions of .NET Core, this was more complicated, but they are simplifying this with the newer version. Inside property group, we have something called as target framework, which says that we are using .NET 8.0, which is the .NET 8 framework. Then we have something called as null label, and that is enabled. Now what exactly this nullable will do, I will cover that in the later videos because it is too early to go into those details. And next we have implicit using statements. If you are coming from any frontend library or any other frameworks, you should be familiar with some import statements that you write to import other libraries. Now because implicit using is enabled here, the default using or import statements from the .NET libraries, we will not have to write all of that. It will automatically be included with our project. If you disable that, then basically you will have to explicitly add import statements, nothing more complicated. But it is a convenience to have implicit using enabled, and that is the setting we will keep as well. Project file basically has all the project properties which are set by .NET right here. And on top of that, when you add some of the NuGet packages or NPM packages, then you have to add them in the project file. Now when we add NuGet package, I will show you how the project file here gets updated in the upcoming videos. But right now when we have the project file, we have the .NET target framework that is really important and we have nullable which has been introduced from .NET 6. I will explain that in later videos as well and we have implicit using. Nothing that fancy right now but when we add more things to our project, I will show you how the project file gets updated. With that brief overview, let me continue from the next video. After the project file, 
we have something called as connected services but that is empty we will ignore that next we have the dependencies when we build a dotnet application we always or most likely will be having more packages that will be added for more functionalities like if we have to access database if we want some payment integration we will be adding more packages right now in our dependencies we do not have any package now when we have multiple project we might also add project as a dependency so when we do that this dependencies will automatically reflect that and we will do that in future videos so do not worry dependencies basically mean that this project is dependent on some packages or some other project but we do not have any dependencies on NuGet package or any other project right now then we have a properties folder and there we have launch settings.json now this launch settings.json basically defines a file which will say that when we are running or debugging the application right here when we click on https what should be some settings that should be used you can see here there is iis settings and there it is saying that you should use the url which is http1 with the port number but if it is an https this will be the port number then if we scroll down we have something called as profiles these profiles resemble everything that you see here you can see we have an http profile https profile and iis express in profile we are saying that when we use http profile we want to run the application on this url and we are setting some environment variables environment variables will basically be like a global variable that is defined and we can use that in application as an example let's say if you are setting asp.net core environment to development then inside the code you can check this variable if that is development you might use a different development database if it is production you might be using a production database same applies for let's say if you have a payment integration if it is development you want to use your development keys that way you do not have to use a real credit card but if it is production then you want to use the production key that way real credit card payments can be processed so we can define all of those environment variables and profiles in launch settings.json if you scroll down we have an https profile and that is what we are using right here you can toggle between the profiles by selecting which profile you want to run the application with we are using https here and here we have the application url let me hide that and that is 7169 i can update that to be 7001 and let me run this perfect when we execute that you can see the application is now running on port 7001 that way you can toggle some of the properties we also have iis express here and you can modify them as per your requirement now typically you do not modify the profiles that much but i wanted to give you a quick five minutes overview on launch settings.json perfect whoops let me stop the application here next file that i want to show you is in the controllers well in the launch settings let me revert back the change so here i can undo my git change and that will bring back the original port now of course you can use whatever you want but i'm not going to change that with that we have covered launch settings and the project file next folder that we have is www root folder and this is an important folder in the application this folder will basically host all of the static content of your dotnet core or your project now what is static content static content basically means any css any javascript any NuGet packages or third-party libraries or if you have any images files pdfs 
PowerPoint, and so on. Anything that is static which does not have an HTML code goes into the www root folder. So you can see right here we have a global site.css which is already being used in the application. So if you want to add some styling here, you can always add that. Next we have the JS file which is site.js but that is empty. We just have a basic template there. Inside the lib folder, we can see bootstrap, jQuery, jQuery validations. All of them are included by default when you create an MVC application. In future, when we have to add images or anything else which is static, we will always add them in one place which is www root folder. Always remember that. After that we have controllers, models and views that I will cover in the upcoming videos but after that we have something called as appsettings.json and then if you expand that you can see we have appsettings.development.json Appsettings will be the place where you will host all of your connection string. Now when I mean connection string it is not just connection string but basically any secret key that you have for your application. An example of that will be for your email you might be using SendGrid or you might have a secret key for email you will add that in app settings. When you have database connection you will add those secret keys there. If you are using Azure Blob Storage or Azure Storage Account you will be storing all of those connection in one place. That way when you have to change a connection, you always know that you have to go to appsettings.json and not go through all the code trying to find out where is that connection. All of your connection or secret keys should always go inside appsettings.json. Now here you see there is appsettings.json and appsettings.development.json. If you remember inside launchsettings.json, we have the ASP.NET Core environment. Now based on this environment, it will be configuring to use a different connection string. Like let's say in production you will have an environment variable with the name of production. Then inside appsettings.json, well in the project here, let me add and show you that new file. We will be adding a new item and we will search for json file. We have the appsettings file. I will call that appsettings.production.json. We save that here and what will happen with .NET Core is it will dynamically use that connection. Whoops, I have a spelling mistake there. Fix that. So perfect. Now in production, if your ASP.NET Core environment name, this is production, then it will be using the connection string and all the settings from this app settings dot production dot json so it is pretty smart on what connection it will use but we will uncover that in the upcoming videos right now we do not want to go into that complexity only thing you should remember is all of your secrets or connection string will go in app settings dot json file let me remove the production file that i added right now we are not going to use that but in the final section where we will be deploying the code, I will modify that and show you how things work. So perfect. With that in the next video, let's examine program.cs which is a critical file. Now I want to cover a main file which is program.cs. In the older versions of .NET Core, we used to have two files. We had program.cs and we had startup.cs. But with the newer version, the .NET team has combined both of those files in one file, which is the program.cs file. Now here, let me zoom out, and when we have to configure a .NET application, there are two things that you should remember. First, we have to add some services to our container, and next we have to configure the request pipeline. In the program.cs, those are the two things that are being handled. 
first you can see there is builder.webapplication that creates a builder on that builder we are adding some services right now we are using mvc for our architecture and that is why on builder.services it has added something called as add controllers with views that way it knows that okay our application will be using controllers and those are already defined in the dotnet project so i know how to handle that service in future we will be adding many more services inside program.cs file like if we have to inject something using dependency injection which is a very critical aspect in dotnet core we will inject all of them inside the services right here and the next thing that we have is we have to configure the request pipeline pipeline basically means that when a request comes to an application how do you want to process that now one thing that you see on line 9 here is we have app.environment.isdevelopment this is the same environment variable that we saw in launch settings.json is development is a built-in helper and you can see we also have is production is staging but if you have some custom environment name you can use is environment and pass it there as well that's too technical for now but i just wanted to give you some overview on how the environment variables are being used here we are saying that if the environment is not development then we want to use an exception handler and we want to redirect to home error page but if it is development then we want to see that exception that is why we have this if condition after that in our pipeline we have added https redirect and app.use static files when we add the use static files it will configure the www root path and all the static files in there will be accessible in our application after that we are adding routing to the request pipeline and we have authorization now ignore this authorization right now we will cover that when we have authentication and authorization in our project but by default in the request pipeline just have that authorization is added if you even forget that that's okay next we have something that is important now when we have an application we are telling it how the routing should work and for that we have app.map controller route it basically has a default pattern that if nothing is defined in the route you should go to something called as a home controller inside there you should go to index action and id here can be defined or not a question mark in dotnet basically means that id can be defined or it can be null so we are defining the default route that it should follow and finally we have app.run that will basically run the project now it might be confusing on what is going on here why do i need program.cs file what is all this middleware pipeline very strange words do not worry when we progress with the course everything will start making much sense the reason i spent five minutes on this file right now is you have a rough idea that there is one file where if i have to add a service to the container or i have to configure the middleware i have to go to program.cs file that is all that i want you to digest from this five minutes and have a rough idea of what i talked about if nothing here makes sense that's okay you should only remember that when you have to configure something in the pipeline program.cs is the place you have to go with that understanding let me continue from the next video if i go to solution explorer and open the program.cs file you can see in the routing we have something called as controller and action remember these keywords for now if you open the solution explorer again you will notice we have a folder with the name of controllers we have models and we have views that basically defines the mvc keyword mvc stands for models views and controllers but how do all three of them come together 
let me show you a brief overview about that in the mvc architecture as i said first letter stands for model model represents the shape of the data so if you have any tables or if you have any classes model will have all of that and what i mean by class is let's say you are building an e-commerce application where you have products you will have orders you will have order details shopping cart and much more models will basically have all of those class files next we have something called as view which stands for the user interface so whatever you see on the screen that is the view part of the mvc application so model represents the data and what you see on the screen is the user interface like if you have a form or if you have a fancy chart that you see on the browser all of that is represented by the view view will control the html element of your web project now you have the view where you have the fancy html that you see on the screen but when you have the data you will have to process or even fetch that data because data might be inside database so you need something to fetch that data and display that in a table on your html view that you have that missing piece or heart of the mvc application is the controller which is the last piece of the missing block here controller will basically handle the user request and it will act as an interface between model and view what happens is when a user clicks on one of the button or opens the website the request will first go to the controller controller will then determine what model it has to fetch it will retrieve all the data that is needed using the models and then it will pass all the data that is required to be displayed to the view component what view will do is it will add all the data in its html formatting and pass that data back to the controller and then controller will send that response back and the data or website will be displayed on your screen so one thing that you should always remember is in an mvc architecture controller is heart of your application and it might sound like i'm repeating this over and over again but mvc architecture can be tricky to understand if you are getting started so let's walk through that again when a user opens a website it goes to a controller controller will then fetch data from the models or wherever it has to do process that data like there might be some conversion or anything that it has to do and once the data is in good shape it will pass that data to the view on that static html it will add the data that controller has passed like in view we might have defined that there is a table but what data that table needs we will pass that from controller to the view then view will add that data in the html and final content it will return back to the controller which will ultimately be passed on to the user screen and user can see the complete website this my friends is the basic architecture of an mvc application now a controller can have many action method action method basically define the endpoints in a controller and we will uncover that in the next video but there is something called as action methods there as well if i go back to the website here you can see where we have the default route we are saying that if nothing is defined you should go to the home controller and there you have index action and something called as id let's ignore that right now you know the basic mvc architecture and let's cover this routing in the next video now we want to understand routing in an mvc application routing basically defines that in the url when you type something where it should send that request to we have configured a default route here but when it comes to an mvc application we have a certain pattern and before i show you that in the application let me walk you through a presentation here to give you a rough idea 
you can see the url pattern for routing is considered after the domain name localhost and port number is the domain name this localhost can be google.com can be dotnet or whatever you want when we have to consider routing we remove that piece and anything after that is considered the routing pattern in an mvc application the typical route that we have is a controller and then action those are the two words that you should always always remember and write it down there is a controller and inside controller there are action methods let me show you that with an example here in this first url you see we have the domain name which is localhost and then we have something called as forward slash category forward slash index and then a number three so the first thing that you see after the domain is the controller name and next thing with a forward slash will be an action name after that if there is anything there that will be the id id is an optional field that we already saw right here you can see that is question mark so if we go back what is the first thing after the domain name that is the category after that we have index and then if there is anything present that will be populated in the id that is the default pattern that has been defined in the dotnet project now of course we can modify some things here and we will do that in the later videos but this is the default pattern we have controllers and inside there we have action based on that i have an example here and i want you to find out that based on the url what will be the category and what will be the action and if there is an id or not the first example here category is the controller and index is the action we do not have any id so id will be null after that we only have something called as category if there is no action defined then by default the action will be index action we do not have any action defined in the second example so controller will be category action will be index and id will be null in the third example here we have controller name as category action name as edit and then we have some id with the value of 3 and the final example here we have a controller with the name of product we have an action with the name of details and id with a value of 3 now you might be wondering what is the importance of this assignment well it is really important from now onwards if you look at a url that is using mvc architecture you can tell what is the controller name and what is the action name now if i go back here we are saying that the default controller is home and action is index that basically means that if nothing is defined after the domain name it is telling the application that you should go to home controller and index action method that is the default route that dotnet team has configured in program.cs if you want you can change that default route but that is the default route and you know how that will be converted to a url if you want now enough talking let me show you routing in action in the next video now you have a rough idea of what is a controller and what is an action based on the url so basically if you have a url from that you can tell me what is the controller what is the action and what is id with that rough idea let me go back to the project here and i will open solution explorer you can see there are three folders here that we have not covered yet there is a view folder there is a model folder and there is a controller folder in controller you can see we have something called as home controller when we are naming any controller one thing that is important is the controller keyword so if you have a home controller you should have the name followed by the controller keyword and that must be placed inside the controllers folder 
If you place it somewhere else, it will not work. These are the rules that are defined for the MVC architecture. So in controllers, we have home controller. In models, we just have one model, which is error view model. It is a basic class file and it has two properties, nothing fancy, and we don't want to go into those detail right now. Another thing that I want to point out is when a request comes to controller, it is not always required that a model is needed. Sometimes it can render a view which can be a static view and no model is needed in that case. But I want you to keep that in mind that model is not always needed. Perfect. So now we have a home controller here and all the views related to that controller will be placed inside the views folder with the exact same name as controller. And this will be home and not home controller. Controller is a keyword here. So actual name of the controller is home. And that will be the name of folder inside views folder. That is the architecture for MVC. We have controllers and all the views that corresponds to that controller must be placed inside the views folder with a subfolder of the exact name as the controller name. So perfect. We can see in home controller, we have an index view and we have a privacy view. If I run the application here and right there, you can see we have a home page and a privacy page. Right now, we only have one controller in our application. So both of the view belongs to the same controller. When we load the page, you can see the URL. We do not have any controller name or action name. We just have this welcome text. Let's see where that text is. Inside home view, we have the index view. If I open that, that is the exact text that we see right here. We have the welcome, we have learn about, and we have an anchor tag with building web apps with ASP.NET Core. So what we see on the home page here basically is displayed from this index view inside the home folder. When we click on privacy here, we have the privacy policy. And if I open the privacy.cshtml file, that is the data that is being displayed right here. Ignore this view data for now, but you can see the paragraph tag is exactly what we have. Now, something interesting that you should notice here is when we are going to the privacy page, the URL here is something that we have seen before with routing. Based on this URL, can you tell me what is the controller name and what is the action name? The controller name is home controller and action name is privacy. Now, how does that come together? I will show you that. But before that, let me change this to be index. So home controller index action, press enter and perfect. We get back to the home page. How did that happen? When we click on home page, it does not define anything in the route. And that is because the default route that we have here, we are saying that if nothing is defined, go to home controller and index action. So that means that even if you define home controller and index action, it will take you to basically the same page. So I hope you can see how things are coming together. But the main question, how does it know where it has to load this particular view that we see? Let me show that. We have home controller and index action. For that, let me go to the home controller here. And we have few things right here. You can see there is something here, but ignore that. What I want to show you is in home controller, what we have down here, these are called the action method. On line 11, we basically have a constructor for our class and I will explain you that in later videos. But other than that, we have three action methods here and they are returning something called as I action result. I was telling you before that there are two things. 
controller and action. What we have defined in the URL we are telling go to the home controller and get the index action. So at that point it will go to the home controller and it will execute this index action. In index action we do not have any code we are only saying return view. What does this mean? Well it basically says that we have to return some view inside the views folder. But what view does it have to return? And that is where the naming that we have given to folder comes into picture. If we have not defined a name inside this round bracket, it will use the same name as the action name. So it will return an index view. But where will it get that view from? It will get that view from the home controller. So it will go to the home folder inside views and there it will get the index.cshtml. And if we type home forward slash privacy, it will execute the privacy action method and the view that it will return will be the privacy view because that is the name of the action method. Now we ignore the error action method that we have here, but you can see how index and privacy are executed. Now with Visual Studio, we have great debugging functionality. For that, what you have to do is right here. When you hover, you can see a circle dot. If you click there, that means you have added a debugger. Let me add that in both the lines here. And if I go back here, and if I execute home, index and press enter, you can see the breakpoint is being hit here. That means that this statement is being executed right now. So that proves that it is going to the index action method. We will have to hit continue here and then it will navigate or continue execution and bring back the website. When we click on privacy, it will go to the privacy action method and we continue here and perfect. So with that, I hope you have a rough idea of how routing works. But let me show you something before I end the video. When we are returning back to the view, actually, let me go to program here and rather than home controller index action, let me set the default to home and privacy and let me run that. Now when the application loads, we do not have any URL defined. So on the home page, it will invoke the privacy action method and that view will be returned. Perfect. Let me roll back that change and I will go back here to controller. There when I am returning the view, as I said before, if nothing is defined here, it will look for the same view with the name of the action method in the folder of that controller name. Now rather than that, I am saying that when the index is being called, I want you to return a view with the name of privacy. In that case, it will go to the home folder and look for a view with the name of privacy and views have an extension of .cshtml. Let me run this. Now the default page, it again loads the privacy page, but to prove you that if I go to home and index, privacy view is being loaded. So you can always overwrite what view will be returned, but this is the default that we have if nothing is present. I will also roll back that change to keep things simple for now. But I hope with that you have a rough idea of how routing works. And again in controller we will have action methods that will define what view needs to be returned back. Now MVC is tricky to understand as I have said before. So I do not expect you to understand 100% of the things that I am explaining right now. But even if you are understanding 50 to 70% so far, that is a great progress. And when you actually start implementing this in the upcoming section, everything will start making much more sense and you will understand why this pattern is so powerful.
With that overview, let me continue from the next video. Now that we have seen routing, we know how the views are being displayed based on the URL. But if I run the application again, that is not the only thing that is being displayed on the page. Because if I open the index.cshtml, you can see there is a welcome text and a learn about that we see right here. But what about this header that we have on the top and we also have a footer? How is that getting loaded? And for that, we have to go to solution in views folder. We have seen what is there in the home view, but we have something called as shared and we have something called as underscore view imports and underscore view start. If you have worked with older .NET application, you might remember something called as a master page and a child page. Underscore layout is the master page of your complete application. If I open underscore layout here, you can see we have doc type HTML, we have a head here with some styling, we have a body, and there we have the header. In header, you can see we have the home and privacy links here, and we scroll down, we have something called as render body. This render body is a built-in helper in the MVC, and that will display anything that we want in the body. Now what that body will be, that will be determined by what is returned from the controller. If we return the index view, it will display that view right here. After the render body, we have a footer here where we are displaying the bulky web. If we go back to the application, that is what we have right here. So underscore layout will be the master page of your application or the main page of your application. Always remember that. And in underscore layout, we will add all the JavaScript, all the CSS that we want to use globally in the application. With that, we have something in the anchor tags like ASP controller, ASP action. These are called tag helpers, but ignore them. When the time is right, I will explain you why we need them. Right now, underscore layout is the master page of your application and whatever view we return from the controller that will be displayed in the render body content of underscore layout. After that, let's go back and we have something called as validation scripts partial. There we have basically included two JavaScript. Now when we progress with the course, we want to add client side validation and for that we will be using this JavaScript. Because of that, on all pages, validations are not needed. So what the .NET team has done is it has added some of the basic JavaScript here. And then on the pages where validations are needed, it has separated that out in a different file. And we can use them in our file only if needed. We will see that in action down the road. But here we have something called as validation script partial. Now one thing that you notice here is in validation scripts partial we have an underscore. This underscore is not required in layout or validation scripts partial. But typically if that is a page or component that is used throughout the application then we typically like to add an underscore. That way when we look at the name we can know that okay this view will be used throughout the application. And there is also a special name for that, which is partial view. Partial view basically means that they cannot be displayed on the page by itself. They will be incorporated as a part of some main view. But that is a little too technical or little too early for now. But just keep that terminology in mind that there is something called as view. And there are partial views by the name partial views are basically the views that you do not use by themselves. They will be consumed inside the main view. Then next we have a view for error.cshtml. This is the view where we display the error message if anything is encountered and we can ignore that for now. 
Now, one main question that I had when I was learning MVC was how does the application know that this underscore layout is the master page of the application? That is simple. We define that inside the file which is viewstart.cshtml. There we are telling that the layout of the application is underscore layout. If I change this to be layout here, let me stop that and run it, things will not work. We have an exception here, the layout cannot be located. And you can see where it is actually looking for the layout. To fix that, what we can do is I can rename this to be layout and then it will start working again. Perfect. So you can see that is how the application is configured to know what is the default layout or master page of your application. Let me revert back the change here. I will keep it underscore layout. That is the name you should be familiar with and not layout. Perfect. Let me run the application and it should work the same. Great. So view start will define what is the master page or what is the layout of your web application. Then we also have something called as view imports. Here we have defined bulky web and bulky web.models. We have added using statements here. If you are working with .NET, you know the using statements are used rather than typing that every time. If not, do not worry. When the time comes, I will show you why using statements are needed. But on top of that, it has added something called as tag helpers. That also we will cover in upcoming videos. But view import, you can think about that as a global import file. Rather than importing or writing the using statement in all file, you can add that here and that will automatically be available in all the views. Now again, the view import or the using statements that we have added here will only be available in the views and not in controllers or models. When the time is right in the future videos, I will show you the importance of view imports and we will also be adding more imports in the file. Let me close all the tabs here and with that I believe we have covered all the files in the views. We have a model, controller and perfect. Now with the overview that we have covered with all the files and folder, it is the perfect time to get our hands dirty from the next video. Now there is one teeny tiny thing that I want to tell you right now. When we go to controller, we have a controller and we have an action method there. It is returning something called as a view. If you are coming here from traditional .NET or some other programming language, you will be smacking your head. What is this view? What is this action result? Why is this return type? Typically, we have a return type of let's say an object or maybe a string or something like a list or I enumerable. I action result is one of the custom classes or rather interface that is implemented in the .NET framework. And that basically implements all of the possible result type for an action method. So even if things are looking like it's magic right now, it is not and when you progress with the course, you will see how everything comes together. So right now, do not and I'm saying that do not try to smack your head or be too hard on yourself on trying to understand every small piece that you see on the screen. By the end of this course, I will cover all of them to make sure that no stone is left unturned. But when I say that just assume this is the syntax right now, just assume that for now. Because I know when I will be moving forward with the course, you will understand all the basic foundation. Nothing is magic, everything is programming. And you will learn all of that by the end of this course. So right now, don't be too hard on yourself and let me continue from the next video.